The Jewish New Year commemorates the creation of the world, the bringing forth of order where once there was only chaos, the birth of the building blocks of life. As Jewish people within and beyond these walls begin to celebrate Rosh Hashanah next week, let us all celebrate, let us marvel, let us be awestruck. For the same force that brought our planet into being, the same force that evolved tiny atoms and molecules and DNA into intelligent life, the same power that transformed summer into autumn and autumn into winter, that same power is still at work in our universe and in us, always bringing about new seasons new creations, new possibilities. Breath of life, breathe in us, with us, and through us. This day as we gather, one in community, one in commitment to truth and love and justice, open our minds and our hearts to the new that's always being created. Come, my friends, let us celebrate, let us marvel, let us be filled with awe. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, and welcome morning. to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House. I'm Kat Robinson Greeter, a member of the worship team, and our members fill in as service leaders once a month, and when our minister, the Reverend Dr. Althea Smith, is away. These services give us the opportunity to hear from guest speakers and for members of the congregation and community to share the things that are important to them and what they've been thinking about. This is my first Sunday back in almost three months, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, this church and congregation is such a big part of my life. And although I've been happy to spend weekends with my mom on Tucker Knock over the summer, I've realized that being away from my church community um, has had a negative impact on my well being and sense of purpose. So I'm grateful to each of you for all that you bring. Uh, to this community, even if it is simply your presence on Sunday morning. Sometimes that's all we're able to do, and that is enough. And I also believe and have personally experienced that my feeling of connection is directly linked to my level involvement. So I do encourage you, if you are able, to become more involved in the life of this community and congregation. You don't necessarily need to join a committee, although there are always spaces to be filled. Um, helping with coffee hour, singing in the choir, being a greeter on Sunday morning once a month are just a few of the air, uh, ways that you could be involved and make a big difference. So if you're interested in any of those or other opportunities, you can talk to me, you can talk to Allison in the office, you can talk to Barbara Elder, our board chair, or Reverend Althea. Our guest speaker this morning is no stranger to our congregation. Gary Breton Granator is the rabbi of Congregation Sharat Hayam Nantucket and is current president of the Interfaith Council. For many years when the Jewish congregation was sharing our building at this time of year, we would have seen their beautiful ark right over here um, for the high holy, holy days. Rabbi Breton Granator has served numerous congregations as their rabbi and is an internationally recognized expert on interfaith relationships, especially with the Catholic, Protestant, and Muslim communities. He has also held leadership roles in many nonprofits, including the American Friends of Kidom, an Israeli educational organization for promising students from disadvantaged communities, the World Union for Progressive Judaism, 
in the Anti-Defamation League. In addition, he was a professor of history and philosophy at Sarah Lawrence University and taught at the NYU School of Continuing Education and Hebrew Union College. Rabbi Breton Granator is the editor and principal writer of Shalom Salam, a resource for Jewish Muslim dialogue, and his most recent book is called A Jewish View of Cults. Among other accomplishments and accolades too numerous to list, um, Gary is also an accomplished musician, which we will be experiencing a little later on in the service. So welcome back, Rabbi Gary. As I often do, I start announcements by encouraging As they do that, um, please, um, we can read together the words that are printed in your order of service. Fire consumes and casts a bright light. May the flame of our chalice consume our regrets for the past, our fears about the future, our worries about today. May it light for us a path of joy and peace. I invite you to rise now. Thank you, Bo and Leah, um, as you are willing and able for the singing of our doxology. for overuse of Mary Oliver's poems. Um, but as I was looking for readings um, in preparation for this service, I, um, I was looking at a collection of poems that somebody online had put together um, as, as appropriate for Rosh Hashanah. And uh, I was reading this one, and the last few words like um, made me tear up. So I thought, oh, that's the one I need to use. 
<laughs> so, this is In Blackwater Woods by Mary Oliver. Yeah. Should we listen to the bell for just a minute? Yeah. For those of you on Zoom, the bell is ringing, so we're just pausing. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires in the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Now. meditation this morning is called Prayer of the Turning at the New Year by Lynn Cox. Spirit of life, source of love, you who know our struggles and failures as well as we know them ourselves, be with us as we enter into this time of reflection. Give us the courage to travel through a moral inventory of our lives, to notice the places where we have missed opportunities to live our values, to acknowledge the times when we have done harm. Inspire us with the will and the means to change for the better. Guide us to make amends where we can. Turn us toward life in the coming year, a life of growth, a life of compassion, a life of learning from experience. Eternal one of blessing, we ask these things not only in our individual lives, but also in our communal life. Lead us to fresh understanding of systemic oppression of dehumanization, of callous disregard for the neighbors we have failed to acknowledge. Open our hearts to the words and ideas of those most impacted and join our hands in the work of rebuilding this world from love. Beloved unseen, 
there are those among us and connected to us who are suffering. Guide us to join you in the spirit of kindness, to support systems of care, and to offer our presence when we can. We pray for all who are affected by police violence. We pray for refugees around the world and for all those affected by unjust immigration policies. We pray for those resisting totalitarianism. We pray for those bearing witness to the destruction of their way of life through ecological devastation. We pray for those who are ill, who are grieving, who are struggling, who are seeking recovery, who are working to make a change. Let your love wash over them and us and bring us into life-giving right relationship. Singer of skies and mountains and pastures, in this season of turning toward life, remind us to be grateful and to celebrate joy where we can find it. We lift up our loved ones who have achieved milestones. We give thanks for the beauty of this day and for this community and for the opportunity to be together. This space holds the entirety of our lives, the highs and the lows. With all of these things on our hearts, we continue our prayer in silence. Amen. Blessed be. Shalom. And as a continuation of our prayer, um, each week we take our time to, time to acknowledge the joys, sorrows, and milestones of the preceding week. We consider this to be part of our theology as it is an expression of our shared values. Knowing that our joys and sorrows connect us all, we use this time to share with each other. Is there a time to rise say and sing say together something? hymn number 128 uh. for all that is our life.
Good morning, all. It's an honor to be with you on this place, in this place, in this wonderful community. Um, I send greetings to, Rabbi, uh, to uh, Reverend Althea. I'm sorry, she's not with us, but she said she was either going to be peeking in on Zoom or she'll catch it on, uh, on a rebroadcast. Um, and Kat, thank you so much for leading a beautiful service and for all of you for welcoming me here. Uh, this is the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Um, I thought I would bring a shofar with me. Um, uh, and I'm going to begin with a, a description of what the shofar does and how we use it. Uh, I want to give you a heads up that um, this was the only shofar I was able to access because the others are in the ark that are being transported and moved uh, for the High Holy Days. Um, this is absolutely a beautiful, this is an ibex horn, by the way, um, uh, but um, this shofar is probably the hardest shofar I have ever experienced trying to blow. So I cannot guarantee you that it's going to be really great, but I, I will give you, a, I will try to give you a, a sense of what uh, the shofar calls are all about. There are actually four calls that we hear, and we actually blow the shofar um, believe it or not, beginning the month before the High Holy Days, uh, Maimonides, a great uh, uh, rabbi from the uh, 12th century, uh, taught us that the shofar really, uh, although I don't know he, if he understood what an alarm clock was, but, but he, uh, he tells us it, it's a wake-up call. It's, it's a way for us to realize that the year is uh, about to begin and we need to get our act together. And so there are four calls and actually they are similar to war calls because the shofar was what was used when war was declared on another uh, neighboring kingdom. If, if, uh, if we were going to go to war, this is how people got up in the morning and heard it was time to bear arms and, and defend the, the community. So there are four calls. The first is Takia. Takia is a simple call. Uh, you'll, well, let's see if we can get one. Right. <laughs> That's it. It's just da da da. Um, the second call is uh, Shavarim, and it is uh, a call um, of, of uh, a series of triplets. Da 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 da. Um, so that's the second call. The third call is uh, Teruah. And then the fourth call is Tekiah Gadola, which is a long version of Tekiah. So let's see if we can do this. <laughs> Shofar. There, there actually is a rabbi who's a jazz musician who actually plays jazz shofar. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about what those calls are, are really about. And um, one of the commentators uh, likens it to the call that a mother has for her children. So the first one, uh, and I'm going to imitate Sylvia Granitor, uh, my mother. Uh, when I was a kid and playing outside, she would uh, call out from the fourth floor apartment building window to the backyard of our apartment complex. She would say, Gary! Gary, Gary, Gary! <laughs> Gary, 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 Gary! <laughs> Gary! That's what the chauffeur blast is all about. The first is the the first call, the second call is a little bit more insistent, the third is really insistent, and the fourth is, you better get upstairs or you're in trouble. <laughs> so I, I brought the shofar because the shofar is so tied into um, Rosh Hashanah, which is uh, Yom Horat Adonai, 
uh, HaOlam. The, today, it's really the birthday of the world. The world was conceived, we believe, on Rosh Hashanah. So there's a discussion in the Talmud about blowing the shofar during this Jubilee year, and Rav Shmuel says, in accordance with those opinions, we pray that on Rosh Hashanah saying, this is the day that is the beginning of your, meaning God's works, a commemoration of the first day. And the reply is, in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who said, the world was created in the month of Tishrei, we therefore mention on Rosh Hashanah that it is the first day. Conception is the beginning of a hopeful process that leads to birth. And throughout the days of creation, God begins with the wind of God blowing over the primordial waters. V'ruach Elohim merachefet al penei ha'om. That's what it says in the book of Genesis, that a wind of God fluttered over the expanse. And then the world was pregnant with possibilities. God separates waters from dry land. God separates light from dark. God called upon the world itself to give birth to living creatures and does it vegetation. It says in Genesis on the fourth day, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, trees, and seed-bearing plants. On the fifth day, God said, let the waters multiply swarming living beings. On the sixth day, let the earth send out living beings. And then consulting with the angels, the heavenly hosts, God sets out to create humanity, which is animated with a breath of life. So at the very beginning, God breathes over creation. And in order to animate humanity, God breathes into them. That's also parallel to the breathing that we do when we blow the shofar. We're blowing out, we're using the ruach, our breath, our spirit to animate life. Then God puts humanity in charge of the world and makes humanity responsible for its upkeep. Going so far as telling humanity to name all of the elements of creation. And throughout the process, at the end of each day, God evaluates and says, Vihine tov, behold, this is good. So God creates, God distinguishes, God names, and God evaluates or assesses. In like manner, we, the stewards of the world, are charged to create through procreation, to discern right from wrong, to name or give meaning to life, and to assess the work of our hands. Last October 7th turned all of that upside down. Everything we as Jews counted on was thrown into flux. We believed that the state of Israel would be able to keep its borders safe. We believed that the amassed strength of the Israeli army would be able to vanquish quickly any enemy. We believe that the greater world could easily distinguish good from evil. We believe that academic institutions and social justice agencies would cry out against the wholesale slaughter of innocents dancing at a festival or working in the fields. We believe that we could conquer the world's oldest hatred, anti-Semitism. We believe that Jews would never again become prey of haters. We believe that we would do anything to rescue those held hostage. We believed in the world's greatest democracies who would pursue justice at all costs. And in the days and the months that followed October 7th, we felt unmoored, confused, dejected. Our hopes and feelings were frayed. When Adam and Eve were at their lowest after they were banished from the Garden of Eden, it says that God gave them clothing Rabbi Meir describes this as an act of chesed, of loving kindness. They may have already covered themselves in leaves, but God gives them clothing at their most vulnerable point. In the Midrash, instead of describing clothing as the Hebrew word or, which is spelt with an ayin, as in leather, um, 
we often call clothing or based upon the fact that original clothing was leather. The Midrash spells the word with an aleph, the same sound, but a different letter. But that word, or, with the aleph, means light. God gave them clothing of light. God gave them hope. Rabbi David Wolpe considered the question, how does a prophet respond when the people are suffering? He answers, Isaiah says, speaking in God's name, for a moment I hid my face from you, and with everlasting kindness will I have compassion on you. Our hearts remain burdened with grief for the hostages who were murdered, and one of the places we turn for understanding is to our ancestors, who again and again endured the pain of persecution and loss. So how did the sages who come before us who also suffered unimaginable losses, understand this verse? Looking at the commentaries, there is a recurrent theme. In every generation, from Abrinic times until today, commentators acknowledge the pain expressed by the first verse. For a moment, God is, or at least, feels absent. And in that dark void, the most terrible things befall us. Where was God in the camps or in the tunnels? There is no fully adequate response. Sometimes we ask these questions not to elicit answers, but to express anguish. Yet those same commentators turn to the second half of the verse and affirm it as well. Yes, the pain is real, but so is the promise. We will always feel the loss. That loss will also permit us to understand that things move us forward. As Rabbi Yochanan points out in the Midrash, our eyes have a light part and a dark part, but we can only see through the dark part. In failure, loss, and grief, in God's hiding is when we see most clearly, we glimpse our deepest concerns and most fervent loves. Considering our trauma, we stand on the cusp of a new year. Can we use this opportunity to return to the charge that the conception of the world offers? As God created, distinguished, named, and assessed, can we follow suit and make something of a year that is being conceived at this very moment? We create. We are reminded we are created Elohim, in the likeness and image of God, and that God is a God who creates. So we are creators. We are charged to build and care for our families and plan for our future. We create community, building strength, building our people, building people we care for and about. We create opportunity, supporting those who need our assistance and our guidance. We create hope by building for a meaningful future. We distinguish. Through our discernment and our critical thinking, we distinguish between evil and good, just and unjust, fair and unfair, hopeful and hopelessness, meaning and vacuity. We look around and see opportunities to lift up those things, those projects, those needs that will bring greater good into our world. We value our time and use that time wisely rather than in pursuit of vain or venal ends. We name. In the Bible, to know one's name was to know that person or that thing's essence. Adam and Eve were given the opportunity to name all of the Earth's inhabitants. We too can give names to things that reveal their qualities. When we name our children, we often use names of those who have gone before us or inspired us in the hopes that this new child will inherit and embrace the qualities of the person whose name they take on but we can also name the evil around us. And by doing so, we call it out far and wide. But we also name ourselves as we learn in the Midrash, which teaches a person has three names, one that is given by one's parents, one given by one's community, and one that is acquired by one's own actions and impact. How are we known in the world? What? are we being named. We assess. 
It's not enough to be in action all the time. At the end of each day of creation, the Holy One stopped and assessed, and then pronounced a verdict. Vihine tov, it's good. Or vihine tov ma'od, it's very good. These 10 days of repentance are part of the assessment process. We look back on the past year to evaluate the effectiveness of our actions, the strength of our convictions, the kindness and generosity of our spirits. What are the verdicts that we render for ourselves? And through the assessment process, how do we reset our priorities, our behaviors, our judgment, our effectiveness, our value, our worth? But there's another aspect to the notion of God birthing the world on this day. Like all expectant parents, there's a mixture of hope and fear as one begins the journey into parenthood. We hope that our children will experience the wonders of the world, live up to or exceed their potential, realize their hopes and dreams and maybe ours too. But we also fear. We fear the pain that they may experience or even inflict on others. We fear for their safety, their health, their well-being, their future. On this day, God too experiences hope and fear. Hope that we, God's children, will live up to or exceed our potential. We'll finally follow the path that God has planned for us. Hope that we can bring about the peace that we are charged to make real. And God fears, witnessing the pain that we have experienced and the pain that we have inflicted. And just like the joys we experienced when the seas parted and our people escaped Pharaoh's grasp, God saw the Egyptians, also God's children, perish in the sea. And God sent Jonah to prevent the Ninevites from descending into sin and destruction. And God must weep at all the young lives lost in the conflagrations in Gaza, Lebanon, Ukraine, and everywhere else. The year has come and gone since our world was turned upside down. A new year waits to come into being, about to explode forth into endless possibilities. And we are architects. We are the architects of what is to be. And while we cannot predict what good or evil may yet befall us, we can prepare ourselves to move our reactions and our responses in new and hopeful ways. And like God, we create, we distinguish, we name, we assess, and God, God waits. May we all have a good and blessed new year. Thank you. From our liturgy, There is a section called the Hoda'ah, Thanksgiving. The first three words in Hebrew are modim anachnu lach, we thank you God for all your gifts.
Thank you very much for that. Most of you know I've been spending a week, a month up in Vermont with my daughter Diana, helping her to make a decent place to live over the winter. Last winter she was semi-homeless while she was renting out her house, and uh, so she bought a real fixer-upper to work on. Um, I'd like to share with you a little moral dilemma that I encountered while I was up working with her in August. One day I drove to Home Depot near Burlington, Vermont to buy supplies and do some of her projects. On my way into the parking lot, I noticed a woman and four children sitting in the shade under a tree by the exit from the parking lot, and a man was standing by the road to ask passers-by for help. I did my buying at Home Depot, which probably cost me $400 with all the various things that we needed. Um, and as I loaded my van with the supplies, I thought of that family by the exit, and I wanted to help them if they needed help. And I felt like I wanted to be generous, and I got out a $20 bill to give to them. Anyway, I drove to the exit, and I pulled over out of the way of the traffic. And the man came over, and I rolled my passenger's window down, and I handed him the $20, and he said a very sincere thank you. And now we come to the dilemma. Please, he said, please, I need a tent for my family to sleep in. A small tent costs $100. Can you give me that? I recall that it had been rainy and windy the night before, and I tried to imagine where they'd been staying and what they were up to and how they could think that a tent would be an improvement. But I guess in the rain, maybe. I'd already felt pretty generous with my $20. I wasn't really up to giving somebody $100 just because they asked me for it. Um, you don't even have to give me the $100, the man said. Right over there is a camping store. You can go and buy me a tent and just give me the tent. I need it for my family. I'm pretty sure many of us have been accosted by people asking for money and wondering whether those people would spend it on drugs or whatever. Seeing the man's family right there, his wife, looking at me, and his offer to just give him the tent rather than money was very reassuring. But oh, I just didn't want to give in to pressure. I'd made my choice and given my gift, and I told the man that I had given my gift. He asked me my name at that point, and he looked at the sky and asked his God to bless me by my name for helping him. And I thanked him for the blessing, and I drove away. So I'm sure you see my dilemma. I'd spent $400 on my stuff and $20 on them. How was that okay? Now my other errand was to get some stuff for dinner. Diana was good about cooking dinner once in a while. Um, so I stopped at a nearby supermarket. And along with a few things for our dinner, I got one of those nice, strong, reusable shopping bags and filled it up with some of my favorite ready to eat foods, plus a gallon of water, and I drove back and gave that to the family. And then I drove home. I'm still not sure if I could have been more generous. I helped, but was it enough? Was it the right thing? Oh well, I never saw that family again, even though I still look for them whenever I go to the Burlington Home Depot. Now this congregation has a nice house, and we have enough to eat, and still, every week at service, we ask that we all contribute to help this organization that we love with its various costs. Our weekly collection will now be gratefully received.
final hymn this morning is number 16, Simple Gifts. Please rise. Rabbis have taught that the greatest gift for which we can pray is the gift of shalom, peace. Um, and as I've often described to our community, peace doesn't mean just holding hands and singing we are the world. Peace is much more complex than that. First of all, the word shalom really doesn't mean peace as much as it means completeness and wholeness. God created a rather diverse universe. The proof of that is through those windows where you see not one kind of tree, but every kind of tree possible. And we look around this room and people are all different sizes and shapes and backgrounds, points of view. So the question is, how do we have all those disparate things work together? That's what completeness, that's what shalom is all about. Not asking people all to agree, but to figure out how each individual contributes to making this world into the world it could and should be, without anyone ever asking the other to give up their unique identity. So shalom is allowing every person to be who they are and what they are, and finding a way for all of us to cooperate and build the world that God really expects us to finish. Because God started the work of creation, but God didn't say at the end of the week of creation, I'm done. God says, it's your turn. It's up to us. It's up to all of us to make this world complete.
תלמידיו של אהרון, אוהב שלום, אוהב את הבריות ומקרבן לתורה. Be like the disciples of Aaron, loving peace, pursuing peace, loving all of your fellow creatures, and bringing them closer to the source of truth. May you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Leah and Bo, would you like to come up and extinguish the chalice? You a little sleepy? You gonna extinguish the chalice, Bo? And while they're doing that, let us say together the words that are printed in your order of service. Though we extinguish the flame that has guided us through this time together, may we continue to carry it in our hearts, reminding us of the transformative power of love and community until we are together again. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this beautiful fall day. Shalom.